Without further ado, I'm very excited to welcome um, Charles Waldheim, who will be the, offering the keynote speech for today. Charles Waldheim is the John E. Irving Professor and Chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture at Harvard University. Charles's prolific body of writing and lectures focus on the complex relationships among landscape, ecology, and contemporary urbanism. He is a recipient of the Rome Prize, among many other awards, and the co-editor of an important volume of essays titled Chicago Architecture Histories, Revisions, Alternatives, published in 2005. Please join me in welcoming Charles Waldheim. Thank you so much, Allison. Thanks, everyone, um, for being here. Um, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure. Uh, thanks to the, um, the organizers of the seminar, uh, to the society itself, uh, Ken and Ken and Pauline, um, for your support and, uh, and hospitality. Um, first of all, uh, after having acknowledged you know, so many friends and, uh, and colleagues and collaborators over the years here and my own indebtedness um, to the city and its institutions, um, I also want to suggest that it's also um, a bit of a setup <laughs> in the sense that while I've spent a lot of time, done a lot of work here, um, many of you in this room know uh, these stories better than I do. And so I want to very much begin with a note of humility. Uh, and I'll frame uh, and characterize my remarks in the context of um, uh, a particular reading. And it's really meant to be a kind of opening to the panels um, that will follow. Um, um, my work is as an urbanist, and uh, I, uh, while I'm not trained as an historian, have worked with um, some historic material. And over the course of the last decade or more, my work has taken me more and more into readings of landscape as a way to understand um, ur urbanism and, and urban economies. Um, and so in that context, uh, what I'll be doing this morning is a very brief reading of Chicago's contemporary urbanism over the last 15 years, let's say, since the turn of the century. Uh, with a particular view on, on a range of landscape projects. Um, uh, my goal is not to do something uh, synthetic or overarching or comprehensive, but rather to kind of open a series of lenses onto what's been going on here. Um, and while doing that, to try to connect it to uh, discourses and practices that might be find, found elsewhere, uh, particularly in North America, but also elsewhere um, in the world. So over the course of the next few minutes, I'll begin with a brief introduction in that introduction, I'll start with um, a kind of history, a kind of story about the origins of landscape architecture, because for my work, it's important to understand uh, and in a way define those terms of engagement. Uh, and then I'll say a brief word about my own work um, on that subject and, and on the, the ways in which my work uh, tries to illuminate uh, contemporary urban conditions. Um, in, in the main body, uh, over the next couple of minutes, um, I'll do a, a brief survey of some recent work in, in New York and Toronto, and, and do that some, some, some comparative work with what's been going on here in Chicago. And in that, I'm, again, not meaning to be uh, offering anything comprehensive, but rather really want to kind of highlight the breadth and the range of activities with respect to urban landscape over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and then I'll, I'll conclude with a couple of uh, more editorial reflections, kind of a, a sense of, well, what, what, where does that leave us and what might still be possible relative to that, um, to that body of work. Landscape architecture was uh, conceived uh, in the second half of the 19th century as a new profession, primarily in a conversation between Paris and New York or the eastern seaboard of the US. And it was founded by a group of people who felt that the existing professional identities, architect, engineer, artist, and gardener were inadequate to the new age. Uh, this formulation, landscape architecture, uh, was ultimately derived from uh, the French. And if you're interested in this, um, there's a fellow called Joseph Desponzio uh, out of Colombia, who's done, I think, the most interesting work on, uh, on Morel and the French origins of what comes to be translated as landscape architecture. Um, I've done a little brief piece on this in uh, Harvard Design Magazine a year ago, uh, and it began for me with a kind of naive question, uh, not being a landscape architect, the kind of naive question that I felt authorized to give myself. Um, my question was this, if a group of boosters founded a new profession in the second half of the 19th century on the eastern seaboard, and if in fact it was first here on the east coast of the US that the profession was fully formed, by that I mean a professional designation, a title, a degree program, literature, a journal, etc. Um, 
Why, why did they refer to it as landscape architecture, and in so doing reject a two-century-old tradition of landscape gardening that was quite available in English? Um, and so, as a way into that question, I asked the naive question, what would have been the first work of landscape architecture under this new professional title? For me, that seemed self-evident because I had been trained to believe that it was Central Park and the kind of origin myth of Olmsted and Vox and the Olmsted firm um, I found to be apocryphal. Uh, the first commission for a landscape architect in the new professional identity in English was for the planning of northern Manhattan. Uh, the first time that Olmsted uses the term was for his commissioning for the planning of Manhattan north of 155th Street. You'll recall that's the moment when the commissioner's grid had exhausted itself given uh, the on the one hand, the, the conception that no one could imagine going further north than that uh, in the beginning of the, of the 19th century, and at the same moment, the exigent topography. Uh, Olmsted had been, of course, invited and then agreed to serve as superintendent of the Central Park. He, of course, had been really uh, down on his luck. He was really out of options. He had been, of course, a noted, a noted journalist and had done many consequential things in terms of social activism. At the same moment, his ventures into farming and publishing had not really worked out financially. He was down on his options, and he agreed to take what was essentially a civil service position as superintendent, a kind of administrator. He was particularly good at this, and over the course of a few years in the 1850s, consolidated his political base very rapidly, lobbying internally for the holding of a design competition. He then, of course, partnered very nimbly with Calvert Vox, who had been trained with Downing, and then produced, of course, the, the winning Greensward plan. He, of course, won this project um, precisely along a party line vote, five to four, all the good Republican reform members of the commission, of course, voting with him himself, a good Republican reformer. I don't mean in any way to diminish that, that story, but what I, I want to do is I want to situate it in a certain set of politics and a certain set of debates. Can anyone tell me what Olmsted referred to himself as during this period of time in the late 1850s? He called himself an architect much to the grin of his partner, Calvert Fox, who was actually an architect. Um, upon winning the commission for the Central Park, of course, um, he promoted himself, that is, Olmsted did, to architect-in-chief, um, and then rendered uh, Vox a kind of consultant, too. Um, and it was deep in the construction of Central Park um, in 1859 uh, that the commissioners began to be concerned about his constant fiscal overruns and a kind of uh, nervous breakdown that they saw looming. So the commissioners sent Olmsted in uh, September, August, September of 59 on a tour of European precedents. And there he made, his, of course, his famous tour of the European precedents uh, beginning in the British Isles and continuing across the continent. He landed ultimately in November in Paris where he spent a fortnight and in, in Paris he visited the Bois de Boulogne no less than eight times over two weeks. And there he would have seen drawings stamped with the service of the architect paysagiste, which he then translated essentially from Alphonse into English as landscape architect. Upon returning to uh, New York um, at the end of 1859, Subsequently, he then appended landscape architect as, as his professional identity to every subsequent commission over the course of his career, uh, beginning, as I mentioned, with the Commission for the Planning of Northern Manhattan in 1860, and then ultimately applying it retroactively to the planning of the Central Park, and then, of course, the canonical works of Prospect, and ultimately the Back Bay Fens et al. And so what I want to begin with is this notion that in its birthright, landscape architecture is concerned with the shape of the city. The landscape architect was conceived as a new professional responsible for managing the social and environmental challenges of the industrial city. And that, of course, was a bit of a shock to me when I read into it because I had somehow been led to believe that landscape architecture had primarily to do with plant material. And this has to do with a very long history in which, uh, ultimately, the urban commitments of landscape architecture at um, the founding uh, department at Harvard or in the founding professional association became so pronounced in the early decades of the 20th century that we spun off an entirely new field that came to be known as planning. And that left in the 1920s and 30s, of course, landscape architecture bereft of our urban contents it left us with the aesthetic, the decorative, the, 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 the less than, than probative. And at the same moment, it left the field a bit adrift intellectually. Uh, and it's only been in the course of the last uh, 10 or 15 years that landscape architects have been reacquiring that birthright and reasserting their presence as the, um, as the urbanists of our age. In that regard, I'm interested in my own work. I have a um, I have a book project that's at press with Princeton University Press right now called Landscape as Urbanism, a General Theory. 
And in this project, um, in which I refer to the found foundational myth of landscape architecture as well as um, more recent developments in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, I'm interested to use landscape as a reading of a set of economic and power relationships. Um, my view now is that landscape reemerges quite regularly as a medium of design in moments of economic and spatial transition. So if we could postulate that there are moments of spatial fixity when a particular economic order is quite stable and a certain set of political relationships produces a stable spatial order, that can most often produce itself in architectonic or urban form. And yet landscape, I argue in my forthcoming book, landscape is called upon to address the immediate shocks in the transitions between these economic conditions, beginning in the second half of the 19th century with the, 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 the cataclysm of industrial economy, to mitigate and to absorb and to really insulate populations from the worst impacts of the industrial era. It was called upon again in a second moment in the middle of the 20th century to deal with the transition to mature uh, Fordist or decentralized urbanization with landscape planning. And then most recently it's been called upon again under the rubric of landscape urbanism in the last 15 years to deal with the transition to the so-called post-Fordist economy, destination tourism, uh, recreation, uh, and leisure. Now, of course, I mean, this image is up to signal that, of course, you know, Chicago has had its own particular history, and I'm not going to spend uh, a great deal of time on that. Many of you know this far better than I do. But I do want to situate uh, the late 19th century in Chicago and the beginning of the 20th century in Chicago in the context of the ascendancy of landscape architecture as a framework for viewing the city and as a new professional identity with which uh, to deal with these uh, challenging social and environmental uh, conditions. At the same moment, um, less so the, the identity of the landscape architect, but more so the medium of landscape, of course, was then called upon again in the midst of the 20th century as industrial economy changed drastically, dispersing itself, decentralizing itself. This, of course, is um, Hilbertsheimer's new regional pattern. And Hilbertsheimer's studies, I think, are indicative here of how landscape can be called upon again in a very different guise at a very different moment. Over the course of the last 10 or 15 years, uh, in a number of ways uh, across uh, certainly Western Europe, uh, East Asia, and North America, landscape has been asserted again as a medium of urbanization. And most often, it's in the context of dealing with transitions from industrial economy, dealing with the remnants of the spatial fix left in the wake of industry, dealing with brownfield remediation, dealing with uh, abandoned uh, post-industrial waterfronts and the like. And so in that regard, I thought it would be interesting to uh, reference briefly what's going on in other uh, comparative places. We could make an equal comparison to Western Europe or East Asia. I'll show briefly a, a couple of projects each from New York uh, and Toronto. Uh, of course, you, you may be aware of the High Line, I think an interesting example of uh, landscape urbanism asserting itself as a medium of city making. Um, what's interesting in part about this kind of work is it's indicative of a general tendency one can find that landscape architects assert their uh, role as urbanists, but through a very particular configuration of um, philanthropy uh, and donor culture on the one hand, a general interest, a kind of rising interest in environmentalism and ecology combined with design culture. That particular configuration of things most often goes around traditional planning processes, not always, but most often. Uh, and of course, you'll recall that the High Line was itself the resultant of a, a public meeting at which members of the community felt as though it should, be, uh, it should be saved rather than being demolished as an impediment to development. And given that the, the traditional planning view that was the, in fact that this piece of uh, derelict infrastructure was in fact preventing development, uh, it was through this community meeting and then ultimately a philanthropic process Project, treating a public park as if it were to be uh, supported like a cultural institution that we, we have the High Line today. Uh, of course, underneath that is, is the more interesting story, I believe, of the zoning configuration, that it's, it's not simply a park set aside for public use and environmental amenity, while it is that. It's equally, of course, um, a strategy for urbanization. And it's that imbrication of the work of the landscape architect, in this case, James Corner Field Operations, Diller Scafidio Rinfro with Pete Udolf, the Dutch plantsman, combining that with a logic of development. These two things are imbricated in a way that I think is clearly a distinct formation than maybe previous formations. Um, and it's not just the High Line, of course. At the boutique end of the scale, we have projects like the High Line. Uh, of course, with Bloomberg's uh, administration, we, we you know, 
setting aside uh, how it ended, we could talk about a range of projects on New York's industrial waterfronts. Uh, in this case, I'll mention just briefly uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park. Uh, again, Michael Van Valkenburg Associates, Ken Greenberg, the urban designer from Toronto, uh, building a, a new form of relationship to, uh, to, 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 to the public waterfront, in this case of the East River, new forms of amenity, new forms of recreation, new forms of, of lifestyle, if you will. Um, in that regard, I, I could find examples like this really across the world in which uh, landscape is reasserting itself and most often in these projects the landscape architect is really the lead, the head of a very complex multidisciplinary team in which um, not simply the public realm but ultimately urban form is configured so as to be both ecologically and socially uh, responsible in some ways. Perhaps the most telling example of this tendency can be found on the waterfront in Toronto. Uh, two projects briefly from Waterfront Toronto, the post-industrial sites of, of, uh, of, of Toronto's Inner Harbour. Uh, design competition for the renovation of Toronto's uh, central waterfront that was won by Adrian Hughes, West 8 out of Rotterdam. Uh, this was a shortlisted competition with five very talented teams, four of which were led by architects. Hughes was the only landscape architect and his scheme won because he was the only design lead to argue that before this was an urban problem, it was an ecological problem. It had to do with heavy gauge trolleys in the streets uh, of Toronto fed by hydroelectric power from Quebec as close to a zero carbon heavy transit system as we have in North America. And whereas most of the other schemes moved this heavy gauge trolley out of the way for more destination uh, event and, and architectural tourism, Hughes understood that it was the fish ecology, the stormwater runoff in relationship to carbon that was really the linchpin. Um, and then of course there is an urban and public realm. It does resolve itself through design ultimately because these projects are not simply about planning, but they're ultimately about resolution in, in form. Uh, and in this regard, of course, uh, we would also mention the Lower Don, a design competition of a couple of years ago, won by uh, Michael Van Valkenburg Associates and Ken Greenberg, for the reconciliation of two long-standing tensions. On the one hand, um, from the point of view of the conservation of the ravines, protecting uh, both uh, Bay Street, that is Canada's Wall Street, but also the central business district from flood event uh, during storms, but equally adding 30,000 new uh, residential units to uh, dense, walkable, transit-based urbanism. That kind of project where urbanism, the development of new residential, dense, walkable, green urbanism in the midst of rebuilding a particular ecological environment, I think that is at the vanguard of these tendencies around the world. I think Waterfront Toronto is among the most interesting examples. You can see here the flood mitigation. They're working, Van Valkenburg and Greenberg, with Banish and Banish and Transolar, the energy modelers from Germany. So they're doing really very fashion-forward architecture, very interesting kind of low-carbon, low-energy strategies. And they're doing this on the basis of rebuilding, uh, in a different site, a newly functioning uh, river delta. Right? So this is not a work of restoring to its original location and function. It's a new work of construction, new construction of uh, working ecologies, a new river mouth uh, to reproduce some of the, the, the ecological uh, services and ecological benefits and many of the species and other environmental conditions associated with the working river delta, but having done so, imbricated with the infrastructure and the public realm of a new district within the city. While that work is quite well known and quite well established, um, I think it's um, important to, in beginning a conversation about Chicago to say that Chicago has both institutionally and on the ground been at the forefront of these tendencies uh, in ways that I can enumerate in a moment. Um, and in some ways I find it interesting to compare and contrast and I'll, I'll often um, for uh, audiences present uh, Chicago, Toronto, New York as three comparative uh, case studies. Uh, and so in that regard, the first comment that I wanted to make in, in this space is how productive Chicago has been in the last 15 years. There's quite a lot of work, as you know, that's been going on. And in spite of the downturn, extraordinary philanthropy, incredible, uh, incredible potential in the public realm, and quite a number of, of activities and, and, and actors on the design side. Um, it is also a very interesting test case for me because unlike the New York and Toronto examples, the mixity between disciplines, between the lead of engineer or the lead of architect or the lead of ar landscape architects or planners is still a little bit up for grabs in that regard. I think that's, that's quite interesting to talk about and a little bit where I'll, I'll leave you in a couple of minutes. But of course, any story of uh, you know, Chicago and landscape begins with the birthright and the front yard and the notion of forever free and clear and what do we mean by cultural building anyway. And so I'll, I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. Um, in, in my estimation, often 
work in Chicago in the last 15 years has been framed in terms of the completion of the 19th century. So on the one hand, we could say that there is uh, the project of completing the unfinished work of the 19th century framework. And in that regard, of course, you know, Millennium Park and the story of uh, Mayor Daley going to his dentist twice a year and having an enterprising, you know, real estate attorney in his office say, well, let me look into that, Mr. Mayor, uh, in relationship to it being an un unfinished piece of the, of, the, of the framework of Grant Park, of course, is, is a story that you know better than I. Um, in that context, of course, the fact that we have the Lurie Garden and we have uh, Catherine Gustafson and Pete Rudolph here offering, I think, a very contemporary, uh, a very equivalent comparison with the High Line in terms of skill set, sensibility, maybe even team members through Udolf, uh, a philanthropic model for the development of a destination garden, but at the same moment, persistent questions about its fit relative to the other pieces. You know, how is this place somehow synthetic and greater than a collection of individual pieces culturally? and yet still absent the kind of um, zoning manipulations and imbrication with urbanism and development that we see around the High Line. Uh, none nonetheless, an extraordinary destination environment, ab absolutely uh, extraordinary accomplishment uh, in which landscape was, I think, central to its uh, conception. Uh, in this regard, of course, by now, you, you know better than I, the proliferation of projects and venues around, around the park. Um, we should, of course, mention the various uh, iterations of the framework plan of Grant Park itself. Um, I do have to make a note here that, of course, you know, in doing this, I'm trying to cover off a fairly broad arc of argument using some cases, but I'm not going to go into great depth. I'm not going to get into questions of, um, questions of uh, quality or, or even style. And I will refer to the principal team leadership, and I want to acknowledge that in some of these cases, there seem to be, after several months of working on this, still questions of authorship and, and, uh, and provenance to be debated. Maybe some of you have some advice for me about that, but I'm doing my best to give you what I understand to be questions of authorship and to address, even though all of these projects have enormously deep teams, um, and I want to acknowledge that while I can't go into, in these brief remarks, great detail. So in this case, Michael Van Valkenburg Associates and their project for Maggie Daly Park as another contribution to the box of chocolates that is Grant Park. Again, extraordinary led through landscape. And this is um, really what one can begin to see as a tendency, which is really, I would position uh, less about um, landscape architecture per se, and more about a fairly healthy competitive environment in which in some projects, landscape architects, in some projects, architects, in other projects, urban planners or engineers, all of these projects involve landscape as a medium of design. Not all of them are really engaged in ecological thinking or infrastructural thinking, but while many are, and at the same moment, I could, I could say that uh, quite clearly, they are all addressing a very new understanding, a very different understanding of the industrial economy of the city, uh, one which is really characterized by destination entertainment, recreation, leisure, and a kind of sensibility of competition between venues for frankly, the kind of event that we're holding here these three days. Um, in this regard, of course, the work around Navy Pier, James Corner field operations, and, and architecture would be notable uh, in this regard, uh, uh, specifically a kind of themed destination in, in environment to lure and to recruit and to enable a new kind of set of economic uh, relationships. At the same moment, um, I think that there's been quite a lot of interesting work over many years um, looking at the uh, infrastructure of the city itself. Uh, primarily its waterfronts. I'm showing you here, of course, the Chicago Riverwalk project with Carol Ross Barney and Sasaki and others have been working on it. Many of you have, have worked on for, for so long as a kind of aspiration. But to see this project realized, I think, is really another tipping point in this story, that it's a project in which public infrastructure, public amenity, the public realm is conceived less as a destination itself, but more as a kind of enabling aperture, a kind of enabling, enabling ar armature in which there is uh, an interest to recuperate ecological function and health, not just for recreation and amenity, while there is that, but equally for uh, a sense of uh, environmental health uh, more broadly. In that list, it would be also remiss not to reference the work of um, uh, JJR and the Smith Group and the broader work they've been doing around the lakefront harbor planning. Uh, I think this is, again, a very broad planning framework. It does have a DNA of landscape architecture behind it, but that ultimately the recuperation of these industrial sites, these harbors and, and, all, and all, they collectively add up to something, I think, as a critical mass over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, in that regard, I think the, you know, the work that Jeannie Gang and her team and JJR have done around Northerly Island is quite uh, significant here. Uh, the taking of the airport will set aside for another conversation, uh, but you know, I, I remember that Monday morning waking up and seeing the news and thinking, well, there 
there, there we are, you know, the axis cut in the runway. Um, and in this regard, I think we see a, an image of the public realm, not just post-industrial, not just taking infrastructure, but, it, but, it, but a conception of the public realm, which is really driven as much through a sense of biodiversity and species and habitat, Again, not simply putting back what had been there historically in the sense of conservation, but using ecology, maybe even curating ecology as a medium of design in the public realm. And I, I just, I love this drawing as a kind of, kind of split, split screen, you know, a kind of a sense that the public realm is incorporating the industrial archaeology, the history of the site, but equally questions of fish habitat, uh, invasive species, water, uh, and the like. In this regard, I think Gang Studios' uh, collaborations with Kate Orff and Scape out of New York are quite significant, and I'm just going to mention just briefly in passing, but, but we, couldn't, uh, we couldn't not reference what I think of as really a kind of seminal project, the Calumet Environmental Center from 2004. Uh, I know that there's a very deep and long history there, and I know that uh, Donna Robertson and her colleagues had a lot to do with the competition itself, and of course, a, a range of other funding agencies and institutions supported this work. But the idea that um, one of the world's leading architects would in the first instance partner with a landscape architect peer and say that we're going to conceive of this in the first instance as an ecological problem is really what I want to leave you with uh, this morning. In that regard, it's not simply a question of flows, although there are flows, but equally the relationship between a work of architecture and its environment more broadly. And so in this regard, I would suggest that beyond simply the formal relationship between a building and its landscape, beyond its aesthetic and environmental and maybe even programmatic sense, I see in, in, in some of this work, I think in the best of this work, the potential for ecology as a kind of operating system. Um, at the GSD in the last several years, we've been working under the rubric of ecological urbanism, the idea that ecology can work on a variety of levels. On the one hand, we can think of it as an applied natural science in the 19th century terms. We can equally think of ecology as really a medium of design in the public realm. Uh, we can ultimately think of it in, in more contemporary terms as its own epistemology. And there's very strong literature across various fields to support that multi-layered reading. And in the last 10 or 15 years, as landscape architects have reasserted their, their urban uh, origins, uh, essentially what they're doing is they're occupying a void that's been produced in the recession of architects and urban designers from questions of environmental performance. What's been referred to as the environmental uh, performative turn in landscape architecture has produced a condition as planning has been primarily concerned uh, with uh, social process and social justice uh, and has become much more of an academic discipline. Landscape architects have occupied a void essentially where they can bring design culture, urbanization as along with environmental performance. I wanted to show two projects um, that are a little bit uh, uh, less the front room of the city and talk about the neighborhoods. I know that'll come up in the panel uh, in a moment. Um, two projects that have their own particular stories and have had their own kind of lives. Um, uh, the first is what, what was formerly known as Stern's Quarry. Uh, this is a, a drawing uh, and a schematic design uh, by Julie Bargman of Dirt Studios out of Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, and they've been sub subsequently uh, eclipsed by the work of um, the site design group. Um, but I think it's among the more interesting examples I've found of a kind of rough pastoral post-industrialism, not really driven by environmental uh, or, or economic terms, really a matter of amenity. There is remediation, there is healthfulness, ultimately. There is some form of program, but the ratio of fishing going on here or bathing to overall remediation is really interesting. So that ultimately, this is an act of stewardship, a kind of public realm that's made available for maybe a different clientele or a different population than the front rooms of the city. Uh, this is a project that's gotten maybe less attention, certainly on the East Coast or in, or in parts of Western Europe. But at the same moment, I think it's a really significant project in the sense that we can begin to see the work of the landscape architect thinking ecologically through a very large brownfield site. And this tips toward really among the central claims of landscape urbanism in the last 10 or 15 years that landscape is capable of responding very quickly and very uh, relatively inexpensively relative to the uh, expensive and slow and cumbersome qualities of, of architecture or urban form. Um, uh, Stan Allen very famously said a decade ago that architecture proves too slow and costly in the context of these rapid economic transformations. And so in projects like the Stearns Quarry or in the Bloomingdale Trail, we see an interesting condition where 
even in spite the, of the new tourism and destination economy, there is insufficient capital to develop all of these projects, and so this really plays to the strengths of landscape architecture. These projects are very good at dealing with very little money and dealing with uh, differential social and environmental conditions along the length of the line. Uh, of course, the Bloomingdale Trail has had a very long history in Chicago. I, I can tell you when I, when I moved to Chicago to teach for the first time, it was my first studio problem that I assigned a long time ago. Um, and at the same moment, what we see here is an interest at addressing the question of the social t transect from the west side through uh, to Bucktown, combining that with an interest in species and biodiversity and the kind of ecological performance that we've been, uh, that we've been referring to. Uh, Lastly, the, the last pair of projects I wanted to show um, uh, are really those two that I think speak to an aspiration of the landscape uh, architect, the landscape designer, the landscape urbanist as city maker. Because in, in, in much of the work that's been going on here in, in Chicago, my sense has been that while it's been very productive and very provocative, uh, it's less often engaged directly, less often imbricated directly in processes of, of development and, and in particular residential development and district building and the kind of urbanization that we see in, in New York and Toronto and elsewhere. Of course, that leads to a conversation of urban economy, urbanization, growth, non-growth that, we'll, that we'll get into. Uh, but in that regard, I thought I would be remiss without touching to these two projects because they're very different examples of two tendencies in the last decade. This is, of course, um, the project for the completion of Lincoln Park to the north uh, from 2004-2005. Uh, this is the work of Cecilia Benitez, uh, Claire Lister, Julie Fleur et al. Um, and I want to mention also, of course, the role of, of the Graham Foundation here. I was very fortunate um, when I moved to Chicago to be introduced to Rick Solomon. Uh, he was an incredibly generous, incredibly generous uh, individual. And the institutional and moral support that, that he gave to questions of landscape really enabled this discourse to happen. In that regard, I think Chicago and the Graham Foundation and Rick personally are completely uh, implicated in this development that's now really found itself around the world. And it was, of course, Rick's insight to say that the Graham Foundation can organize a design competition to stimulate discussion about how to complete the park framework. And I think he was very smart to use completion as a rubric in which um, some really very interesting and provocative work got done. Uh, in this regard, I, I do think that the, the Benitez Floor Lister project really gets at a sense of ecology as a kind of active operating agent toward urban form. It's not simply a matter of separating out the public realm and separating out environmental performance from urbanization, but that ultimately the configuration of urban form, uh, the development of public infrastructure and public right-of-way could itself come out of a reading of the ecological function of that site. I think that work is still very fresh 10 years later uh, and is really prescient of what, what's happened over the course of the last decade. And of course, on the south side, you have the, the case of you know, Lakeside and, and uh, the developments um, uh, down, down south on, on brownfield sites uh, by SOM and a very, very deep team of others as well um, that picture a very, very different image of how to think about urbanization, a very different image, a very different idea about how to think about environment and ecology uh, and public realm. Um, in, in that regard, what I thought I would um, leave you with are a couple of brief reflections on that kind of overview. Uh, again, uh, reiterating the sense that Chicago has been really at the forefront of this tendency for, for landscape as a medium of urbanization. It has both stimulated and enabled the discourse. It has produced and, and really enabled a range of practices. And it has been venue to and home for a number of projects that are ongoing that I think are quite significant internationally. And I, I'm not just telling you that. I also tell audiences around the world this. Um, in that context, I find it interesting to try to use this as a reading of the broader economy uh, and the broader political economy of the city. That is, to take a, the kind of pulse of the city to try to take a kind of litmus test of it. Um, in that regard, I would say that um, this is really uh, commensurate with the broader tendencies of landscape urbanism around the world. I think that we have some really fantastic projects that are extraordinary and overwhelmingly um, they have this condition of reinforcing this tendency toward a kind of destination entertainment, recreation and leisure economy. Uh, below the fold, there is, of course, a conversation about uh, EDS and MEDS, education and healthcare, as the second level of that economy. Um, in that context, of course, if I had um, more time, I could tell you more about campus work and the work of Peter Schout, uh, Herr Schout on various campuses, the University of Chicago's work, the work at IIT, the work at North, Northwestern and other places. Um, having said that, it's my view that those projects and their equivalent on the healthcare side 
really tend toward a campus typology, very, very different than the kind of work that I'm referring to here in the building of infrastructure and the public realm. And that ultimately, um, I think there's a very interesting and healthy case study here in which the disciplines are still kind of competing with each, with each other. And unlike Waterfront Toronto, which has really consolidated the sense of the landscape architect as lead, or unlike New York in which they've argued for a particular configuration of development capital in relationship to landscape architecture and planning, what's interesting for me about Chicago is how healthy the mix is right now. Projects led by architects, pro projects led by landscape architects. On the one hand, I know many of you feel on a day-to-day -day basis that it's an ongoing kind of struggle, and I admit that it certainly is. Uh, I have the luxury, you know, you're in practice on the front lines meeting payrolls weekly. I'm, I have the luxury as a, a talking head to back up and say, well, this is what I understand to be the conditions. Um, in, in those contexts, I would say um, I was struck by um, the comments of uh, Mayor Emanuel a year ago. He came to MIT and gave a talk at the launch of a new center there, the Center for Advanced Urbanism uh, at MIT. Um, and he, he really uh, struck me. He said that he acknowledged immediately um, um, his concerns around uh, his cultural portfolio, to put it that way. It's coming very close on the heels of the Prentice loss and a range of other things. And um, he said that it was not clear to him which sector of the economy Chicago could dominate in the next century. And I, I don't want to, you know, it's not my field, I don't know, but to have the mayor uh, you know, in office say this publicly uh, was striking. And he compared it, of course, with the, the range of global cities that are by now, uh, you know, kind of obvious to people. And his position was that ultimately, it was really through tran transit uh, and education, and in particular, you know, the public system and also the community colleges. Um, and in that, I took a kind of reading of, of his relationship to these projects that, you know, had basically given itself over to a certain set of economic uh, futures and in which uh, the public realm was significant, but that ultimately it's about recruiting uh, those kind of destination tourists, uh, people that want recreation, leisure, forms of lifestyle. And that was of a piece with his sense that it was really um, an economic challenge. And in that context, not knowing which sector of the economy Chicago could own going forward, he was really painting a very, uh, in his terms, a very kind of dire picture in the context of needing to compete very broadly across a range of, of activities. Um, it strikes me that the most recent debates um, uh, around, uh, first of all, you know, the Chicago Olympic bid, but also uh, more recently around the, the Lucas um, Museums or the, the, the Obama Library. I know that these are all very kind of partisan, very hard fought arguments, but they struck me as of a piece with Mayor Emanuel's comments in the sense that um, I think we're re really still seeing play out a kind of historic struggle from the 19th century about what do we mean by forever open, free, and clear, except cultural buildings? <laughs> um, I'm not going to comment on whether you think Star Wars is culture or not, um, but I do think that uh, Chicago has been absolutely at the forefront of these uh, tendencies and has produced really an extraordinary volume of work over the last 10 or 15 years. I'm convinced that it remains an absolutely significant international case study for the next decade, uh, and it will be interesting to see if the projects that are arguing for an ecological approach can eclipse some of those that are favoring much more of a kind of uh, planning strategy. So, thanks very much.